where I see people fail, and this is true, I think, in residential brokerage, certainly commercial, um, be it leasing or um, investment sales, practically anything. I mean, do you have a pipeline? Do you have listings? Do you are you getting stuff under contract to where you do keep grinding at it, you'll get closing, or you literally come in and every day not sure what to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the industry are getting no mentorship. They're 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 just sometimes just like, hey, we hope you figure it out. And if you do, you grunt through that, you kind of go through that gauntlet of and congratulations, you're really successful. A lot of people fail out. So I, I would I would say get a mentor, work, you know, work on a team. If you're brand new, if, work on a team as a junior person. Mm-hmm. I, I really don't see any good reason to just try to like fly your own flag by yourself. Yeah. Beyond the Blueprint podcast, welcome back to episode three at season two. I'm your host, Branson Bowen, and today I have the great opportunity to sit down with Josh Harris. I'm gonna let Josh introduce himself because he's got a quite of a resume. Um, So if you wanna go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Branson. It's uh, great to be here. So um, I like to, I, I've kind of had an interesting kind of dual life between academia and industry. So I am currently the executive director of uh, the Fordham Real Estate Institute. That's with Fordham University, which is out of uh, technically headquartered in Bronx, New York, with a lovely campus in Lincoln Center right in Manhattan. But we, I, I teach online because I actually do here reside in Orlando, Florida, and uh, we are open to the globe. So that's yeah. kind of my fun <laughs> thing. And, it, it's an inter- and it's kind of interesting to be part of what's somewhat of a startup as in there, a newer program been around a couple of years composed to a lot of you know, academic programs that can sure. be around forever. Uh, the other kind of more interesting, my, my, my business life or kind of the entrepreneurial side is I'm a managing partner in Magnolia Hill Partners, uh, which is kind of a family office backed investment platform. And I'm, I'm primarily focused on real estate. I've basically been a real estate economist, kind of come from the real estate financing capital world and I've done all kinds of interesting things in that world and continue to have fun in it even today. That's great. That's great. So there's a lot of things there. So let, let's start off. How did you get interested in real estate? Like what was that that season of life for you like? You know, real, it's, it's interesting because I... In high school, I was kind of the proverbial good at math and science kid, right? So engineering was just, you know, I didn't really want to be a doctor and something mathematical was there. So engineer was this sort of point. And I, I like construction. I think I like watching construction projects. Sure. In fact, I still, I actually remember visiting Orlando when I was good. We were going to live here watching what would be CNL One Tower. If you know downtown Orlando, is one of, one of the nicer high rises that went up in the mid nineties and watching it under construction, just kind of being mesmerized, watching the cranes as they're lifting materials sure. high in the air. So I looked at industrial engineering, thought I was going to go the engineering route. Then I got an actual internship with a uh, Hubbard construction company and it was, you know, a very good internship. Um, but I looked at all the engineers life and said, I, I just don't think I really want to be an engineer. Look, <laughs> I mean, no, no offense to them. It's a great profession, but sure. look very boring to me. Yeah. Then I, so I'm I, literally, this is not a joke. I'm, Looking at you know, the the uh, course catalog, I went to you know, University of Central Florida, and I'm thumbing it through, looking in the back, and they have real estate courses. And I kind of got an interest in real estate. I had some you know some family members who were like you know just invest in houses, and there's real estate classes, and they then lead me to this major called finance. So in about a one day span, I said, I, you know I'm I'm looking at this finance major. Wow, investments and corporate, all these things seem really interesting. All these classes part of this part of a business degree. I didn't look at all the engineering courses, statics, dynamics, all stuff like these things really boring. <laughs> Just and I'm like, I don't want to take any more of these classes, but I want to take these classes. So in about 24 hours, I decided to switch my major. Okay. Then I went and got my real estate license and I started working, you know, for some small brokerages. I got kind of there in commercial real estate. And it's kind of everything went from there. But it just it was literally one of those, this is really interesting to me. And I jumped on it. And, you know, I just haven't really turned back since. And I I find that's kind of a similar story for a lot of people in real estate. Are you ready to go beyond the blueprint? Introducing Nexus, the ultimate game changer for commercial real estate and development professionals. Nexus revolutionizes how deals are made and projects come to life. With our cutting edge SaaS platform, we're revolutionizing the built environment, making your workflow seamless. Vendors gain instant access to opportunities tailored to their needs, while organizations find consultants, vendors, and contractors with the click of a button. Our all-in-one mapping and deal-making interface powers municipalities and site selectors to shape the future of cities nationwide. Join Nexus today and be a part of the future of commercial real estate and construction. Visit our website now to pre-register and get immediate access to what is to come. Visit gonexus.us. 
The power to transform your project starts here. So do you have a major draw towards real estate? Aside from obviously seeing the tower being built <laughs> and seeing you know, the impact on the community, what is that kind of passion for you in the real estate side of things? Yeah, you know, the built environment, which is a, a phrase that increasingly some of the academic or urban minded people use to sort of talk about real estate construction, urban planning, all, you know, all these myriad of uh, disciplines that kind of come together. I think that watching cities develop and see how we live and just, you know, sort of the the core fabric of society that is, is very interesting. And also because it intersects with capital and kind of the investment finance side, which I just find very um, intellectually interesting and, sure. look, and, you know, fun to make money looking at money kind of thing. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, it's kind of cool, right? I mean, I think that it merged a lot of interest for me to the point that just everything else looked boring, whatever I looked. And there, there were moments even when I was like doing an MBA and things where I just thought, oh, maybe I want to go more back to call it pure finance or in that world. And every time I sort of would approach it or start to look at jobs and that, they just dream boring or like, oh, like I feel like I'm walking away. But then every time I would go to sort of like a real estate conference or deal, I'm like, wow, this is like, I always felt home for me. Sure. So that that just sort of became, um, well, eventually I'm in it long enough that like I haven't really, you know, really, I haven't, I haven't reconsidered my life choices or <laughs> career. Um, so, you know, going into the economics portion. So, you know, obviously you've got a passion, it seems like for, for finance and, and mm -hmm. you know, seeing how the money works and flows and then also real estate. So where did the economist portion come in? That is probably one of the most interesting kind of twists in a career that, that people will make or could make somewhere like why did I go get a PhD right like why did I decide to enter this sort of world of be a real estate economist I got a PhD in finance and the, the not dissimilar to the way it was kind of a, a fast decision to maybe switch my major into finance but uh, it was early 08 which for those who are kind of old enough or in the business that was kind of a hyper go period like that 06 07 08 period, especially here in Florida I was working in kind of a debt equity kind of placement shop um, means like we would help uh, raised debt or an you know an equity for real estate primarily development projects well early 08 it was kind of handwriting was on the wall that things were just not going to go well right sure. i mean and and i had this sort of realization that well if, if our firm doesn't close any deals i'm not gonna make any bonuses which is like the purposes kind of for being in a company like this and well wait a minute this company really has a lot of capital so if they're not going to close deals i don't think they're gonna be money for my salary right <laughs> making a realization right and this is kind of becoming obvious so uh, one of the partners of the firm had been kind of an academic going back and forth. Somebody be a, a, ended up being a great mentor to me. He said, Josh, and this is, I'm not para, I'm not joking about what I'm saying. He basically said, somewhat paraphrased, you, Josh, you're a smart guy, but no one's really going to respect you as a smart guy unless you go get a PhD. And he, this person had a PhD <laughs> yeah. and thought he was smart, apparently. So and it was like, and he was starting at UCF as a the first endowed chair in the real estate program, kind of trying to launch their program. And he said, Josh, I've you know emailed the director of the program who I actually had met in prior, you know, my prior studies at UCF, and he really liked me. I liked him. He said, We can get you in on an assistantship, but you have to kind of rush through to an application. So kind of it took about two weeks, decided to do it. So then I started in the PhD program in August of 08. And if you quick history lesson, September of 08 comes. That's when Lehman Brothers and all mm -hmm. that stuff happens and like the whole world wipes out. So suddenly, like where I'd given up what proverbially was considered kind of a good job coming out, especially, you know, coming out of school to make literally 25 grand a year as a research assistant um, suddenly seemed like such a bad move as I'm watching the rest of the world, you know, sort of burn down in, in the uh, safety of an ivory tower yeah, right. of academia. And that's basically when I sort of sort of took on the real estate economist by trade, started working in the consulting world. So when I came back kind of into the industry dual life, which happened while I was still doing my PhD. Um, and then ultimately with Lakemont Group, with my consulting group, then with Skanska as, you know, head of their, head of their, uh, head of U.S. strategy for a couple of years and now with Magnolia Hill Partners. That's where that sort of frame where I became this, you know, call it a real estate economist working on, you know, sort of a market expert, more of a, you know, more in studying of markets and, uh, you know, that kind of academic researcher side. And, and and in the industry world, they sometimes call that the research and strategy side, sort right. of, right, is, is sort of the, way, the side of the business. Sure. So for those of the people who don't know, what is an economist? Hmm. What do you do? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm not sure I've ever actually been asked. What yeah. is an economist? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a very generic term to generally refers to people who are engaged in the study practice of understanding the economy and the world, essentially how it works. And interestingly, then there's a lot of different fields in it. Most people, I think, if you he if you hear the word economist, they think of sort of like a macro economist, kind of like what people think of as like the Fed, the Federal Reserve chairs or, 
you know, the old Ben Stein kind of thing, like, you know, talking about, you know, yield curves. And I, I did study a lot of that. The world that I kind of came from and, and the constructs of my PhD was more people who were from what's called microeconomics, which actually just means kind of the study of any small systems of things that are essentially people. It's actually more aligned to psychology than people might realize because it is about human behavior and decisions, sure. right? Because that is how our economy functions. So an economist is one who essentially studies or professes when that's on. And, and my area is, spe you know, specific specialty, even though I was kind of trained in a behavioral economics kind of group and behavioral finance group, which is wickedly interesting stuff compared to kind of the more old neoclassical types. But I'm basically a real estate economist, specifically more of a commercial real estate specialist, which actually the majority even of real estate economists actually are considered housing specialists. Oh, really? I mean, so I'm kind of in a more unique niche and that, you know, that, in fact, even focusing on development kind of as a specialty um, is even more of a niche, which is, I mean, I think actually helped my career a lot because there's fewer people doing this, but yet you can drive around, there's plenty of activity. Yeah, so it's not sure. exactly like it's not a topic people are wanting to talk about. Sure. So what is that tie between the human psychology and how the economy functions? Well, think about it. the economy is essentially the net result or the, or the collection of all the, of, of collective human decisions. So a lot of the, where, where the tie-in is, and this is where these sort of fields kind of in behavioral economics have kind of um, smashed together, is essentially human behavioral decision-making, right? So a lot, of, a lot of economic study is all based around the theory of decision-making. Now, in that old neoclassical form, it's like, does a firm produce more widgets? Does it invest? Does it hire more people, right? Those are decisions. On the more personal behavioral side, which is more psychology is, do you buy more widgets, right? Do you invest? Do you, you know, and there's paradigms like, will does a person choose to forego having health insurance while buying an extended warranty on a TV, sure. right? There's all these kind of interesting things and somewhat paradoxes that we all behave in unique ways, right? And and that's where the study kind of crosses over. And the theory is obviously, and we think about even in real estate, right? Okay, if we understand how, how people are going to behave and desire things like, are they going to buy a house? Do they want to rent an apartment? How much are they willing to spend? How much are they willing to essentially give up of their budget allocation, right? All of those decisions that ultimately empower what kind of rents, returns, and ultimate demand there is for real estate. Sure. And are you seeing, because you had mentioned that it, it it's really helpful in the development world. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing more bigger developers, boutique developers actually use people like economists to help, you know, their their trajectory and their pipeline of where they target, which markets they target, what product they deserve to deliver? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And whether it's directly because I, I, you have to be fairly large to, I think, actually have someone like me, um, like on staff, but, you know, through consulting or other, like through data providers, I mean, we, the real estate industry is becoming increasingly data driven. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more data vendors and companies that are providing market data, collecting it, scooping it up. L literally, there's vendors that have cars, all, all of like Google that are driving around monitoring commercial buildings with cameras, I even have airplanes that are scanning for new buildings being built. So increasingly, even a small firm, obviously through subscription fees, or they listen, you know, they, they go and read advice for higher consultants. Yeah. I mean, increasingly that is almost becoming the norm. Um, if you're raising capital in institutional setting, having kind of a research strategy arm is almost kind of a somewhat of a necessity, certainly as you get to scale. So you're increasingly what you're seeing is real estate decision-making be that lending, investing, developing, whatever is being done in a more data-driven way. It doesn't necessarily mean that like People are feeding data into some model and it picks out Pittsburgh. We're going there all of a sudden. Like, doesn't quite, I mean, people have tried that. It's not really what's happening, but sure. that is sort of the direction we're moving. Not dissimilar to where you see with stock and equity and kind of other, um, like, wealth management type of operations going sure. to. Sure. So, you know, if, if someone is younger, right, and they, they have a passion for finance, but they also have a passion for real estate, what type of advice would you give them into, you know, they're graduating college, mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out their career path, they have a passion for both. Yeah. How do they navigate that world? That's a great question. I get asked that type of question or a version thereof by students often and, and have for a long time. The advice I give is a very is a hyper practical one, um, and that is just get a job. Sure. I mean, to some extent, the best your next job is probably not your last job, right? especially if you're coming out of college. Chances sure. are, and similar to when I got, you know, I think maybe one of the best jobs I ever had was the one I somewhat hated the most was this internship I had with Hubbard Construction Company. And there's nothing wrong with it; it was a great company. The people were very nice. It's just that. I didn't want to do that work. Mm -hmm. It helped me discover I didn't want to do that work. Right. Right. So sometimes if you're really interested in finance and real estate, if the first job you get offered as a bank as a credit analyst, great. 
maybe you'll love that environment. You realize, wow, there's a whole bunch more stuff to this. It, it, maybe it sounded boring when I applied for it, but now I realize this, this is actually really cool what I'm doing, there's pathway. Great. Or you realize, boy, this is, I don't want to do this. I don't want to show up every day. Then you need to switch or try to, you know, try to carve out what you do. And, you know, I think that's why networking and going to, you know, going to, going to the um, industry and trade events, real estate has tons of them relative yep. to a lot of industries. Talk to people, go have coffee. What do you do? What do you, what do you like about your job? And then kind of hopefully find something that fits, but you just got to try stuff. I don't, I don't think there's any way you can sort of sit down, like do a, you know, like a, you know, a, a pro and con analysis and you're going to find the perfect career because it switches, you move it. And most people have done, most people have done multiple things in different varieties sure. over their career. Sure. And so you had mentioned networking and, and you know, the people that you kind of surround mm-hmm. yourself with. So was there any in relationships in your life that kind of helped lead you in your career path or you just throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to figure out what's next? Uh, many, many relationships. Yeah. And I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even, and you know, enumerate all of them that people who showed something to me or someone who or sort of discovered me in one way or the other, be that, be that on a job search or just, you know, working alongside them in careers and said, boy, you, why don't you come help out on this? Right. And I think, I think, I mean, I always had to make the decision, right? No, no one's ever going to make your career decisions for you. But I mean, I think, you know, good mentors will tell you, say, you'd be good at this, right? Or you're not so good at this. Sometimes it's like, you know, listen, you could do that, but you're really going to be better doing this. Now, they, I will give it, I'll give words of caution that the advice you get is conflicting, right? So if you, if you go out and find yourself four good mentors, and let's assume that they are, they're all honest, good people that really do believe in you, but they all come from something, something different. They might all give you four conflicting pieces of advice, right? And typically, any advice, including someone like me, is comes from my own biases. So I always, you're always owning to your own decisions, but I think a lot of people um, consistently, and, I, and I've, I've been ever blessed in realizing just how many people are truly there. And, you know, I think one of the most important things I can tell anybody, especially younger people who maybe don't, who, who don't necessarily realize this is the way the world works is if you're in trouble or you need help, ask for help. Yeah. Like the world will, you know, we all get bombarded probably with emails, people trying to sell us a product or get us to do something or give money to do something. You don't get probably that many emails in a, or, you know, messages in a day. Hey, can you help me? I need to find a new job. I just got laid off. I'm graduating from college. I don't have anything lined up or I hate my job or this, you know, whatever it is, or I just don't feel like I'm at my max potential, right? People want to help those people. Sure. And I'm sure you, you know, right. Be okay. It's okay to be kind of verbal and ask for help. And you'll be shocked how many people will actually say, oh, I've been in that same situation. Cause we've all, guess what? We've all been in some situations of that format. Sure. And if you ask for the kind of, if you just ask for help and then willing to accept it, you'll, you'll be a lot further than you trying to just, you know, grunt it out alone. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think a big portion of that is right. Being vulnerable. And I think very that th- this industry is, is very much, we move so fast. It's very capital intensive. Mm-hmm. It's high stress. Um, there's a lot on the line and it is difficult to ask, yes. f- ask for help, you know, cause you want to, especially being young, you want to have it all figured out. Um, but like you had mentioned, you know, there's a ton of people, especially in this industry that have been through the same things that you've been through or you're going mm-hmm. through. Um, you know, so really relying on good, you know, you've got to vet them out, right? Yeah. Because not, a, not all advice is good just advice. That this is, and this is sort of a very, the class thing back to sort of the economic you know, behavior principles. Everyone kind of speaks to their own biases. They, they talk sure. their book per se, right? If they're, and, and to so some, some extent, everyone's going to be kind of a salesperson for what they are of the moment, right? Sure. Um, until they're not. Right. <laughs> so, so if you walk in just realizing that someone who probably, if you go talk to have lunch, somebody who works at a bank, they're probably going to sell you on why banking is awesome, right? Right. And if they don't, that's maybe interesting information, but, you know, but don't be shocked when, you know, if you go to, if you go to a barber and they suggest you get a haircut, right? Sure. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's nothing wrong with the barber. That's who they're just doing good business, yeah, but you right. shouldn't, you should fact, you know, take counsel with a, with appropriate caveats. Right. And I think, you know, that interpersonal type of reflection is good You figuring out what you really like yeah. to do. Um, especially early on, you know, as you're trying to figure out your career, you've, you've got to kind of test out a bunch of different things because there's a lot of doors that open just mm-hmm. by doing that. You also, and I, I, I cannot tell you how, in, how strongly I feel about the statement. I'd say it's really great when you discover things you don't like. Yeah. Like you move to a city and you don't like it. You try out a new hobby and you don't like it. You, you get a job and you don't like it. Now there's a difference between not liking something and then sort of not being good at something or being or something being new, right? Because everything that, in fact, this is if there, if you if you ask me a question for like, well, what's a big failure point sometimes for people in a career that I've seen coming out of college, is sometimes they get into an environment they're not so good at it because well, we're all not good at things when we start, 
and they sometimes shy away because of their of more of a difficulty skill. So you have to be sure. smart enough to realize that I just don't want to do this because I'd rather be doing this. Sure. Is there a replacement or I'm just not I'm not great at the learning curve. Like like if you ever played video games or any or sports or anything, right? Chances are you're horrible at first. first times, right? And it was very frustrating. Same thing is true in jobs and careers. So you have to be a little bit smart about that, but you know, I really do, I'm thankful for the jobs I hated because they really helped me discover the things that were good. Right. What are some key indicators, you know, especially on the brokerage side, right? Mm -hmm. Because it takes so long to get your, your on the commercial side, yeah. your pipeline built, you'd close a deal. What are some of those indicators where it's like, hey, I've been doing this for X <laughs> amount of time. This isn't the right thing. Right. So brokerage is one of those industries that um, it, you know, it's got one of the lowest barriers to entry relatively for a lot of professions and commercial or other, you know, getting a real estate license is not hard. That's generally the minimum ticket. Um, you're more established kind of professional highbrow firms, like the kinds that are in the towers or like surrounding us here. They're going to want you to have a college degree. Uh, they're going to, they're going to put you through more of a, um, a measured pace of a, you know, more of an analyst assistant type of thing before they kind of let you out there selling. At least I think the good ones do. Um, so I, I think the broker, the first thing I always say to people, because there's a lot of people going in, it's a lot of their first careers, it, it's not for everybody. And it's okay to actually realize that there's other things that are way better for a person. And so if you're failing per se brokerage or just not liking it because of the uncertainty or whatever reason, it's okay to do something else. Sure. Um, that said, it can be a very highly rewarding, successful field. So, you know, it, it, it does... Um, excite a lot of people. I, I think the freedom, I mean, what, what people do like about that, and this, it's, there's a lot of parts of real estate that have this similarly where you have a lot of entrepreneurial freedom. You you do sort of, you don't necessarily have a boss checking in on you at the same amount of time. Um, flip side is you may not have much of a salary, if any, right? You have, you know, kind of eat with you kill and that, you know, so there's, there's um, I mean, one of the, look, in the, in the, go back to the economic principle, there's always trade-offs. There's always, you know, incentive alignment. And for some people it's great. Some people it's not great. Sure. And so I guess going back to that question is like, you know, cause I'll get a lot of, especially the younger guys, sure. you know, Hey, I've been doing this for eight months and I still haven't closed a deal. I've got a lot of leads, deals have blown up, but I haven't closed a deal. Or, you know, I've also seen people who they don't believe in what they're selling, you know, especially getting into commercial real mm -hmm. estate, not having any previous background. Right. It's hard to pitch a, potential buyer a $4 million building when you don't believe it. <laughs> well, that's an, I mean, if you're not, if, if not believing is an interesting thing, is it, is it not believe or not being skilled enough to understand it? Right. Just sure. same, because sometimes I think um, where I see people fail, and this is true, I think in residential brokerage, certainly commercial, um, be it leasing or um, investment sales, practically anything is, a lot of, you know, some firms, like I said, take the standpoint of on day one, you're not allowed to talk to clients. We need you. You're going to be like building Excel models, doing the marketing pitch decks, doing market research. You might be organizing the call schedule and then they might let you go become a cold caller. Sure. Some places first you go right to the cold calling standpoint. They're just, here's a little script or I'm so-and-so with XYZ firm. Yeah. Are you interested in selling your property at ABC Main Street, right? Sure. You know, things like that. Um, the challenge is that because of that sort of high, low barrier, but high failure rate, a lot of firms, there are a lot of firms candidly that just don't put any training in. So if you're someone you've been at eight months, you know, if you're on your, like, I, I will say, and I will say this to all students is that, listen, you graduate college, you get a real estate license and you go work for a firm where literally they'll say, congratulations, here's your business card. You get a company email. There's some training manuals here, start calling, right? You know, uh, what a horrible way to start a business. What a, you know, people are just not skilled enough. So I, I, you know, now granted eight months, could some deals take that long to close? So the question, so I would always say some, well, I mean, do you have a pipeline? Do you have listings? Do you, are you getting stuff under contract to where you do keep grinding at it? You'll get closing or you literally come in and every day, not sure what to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the industry are getting no mentorship. They're, they're, they're just... Sometimes it's like, hey, we hope you figure it out. And if you do, you grunt through that, you kind of go through that gauntlet of, and congratulations, you're really successful. A lot of people fail out. So I, I would, I would say, get a mentor. Work, you know, work on a team. If you're brand new, if, work on a team as a junior person. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't see any good reason to just try to like fly your own flag by yourself. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Bryce Knuth of Insurance Office of America. 
As a contractor or real estate owner in Florida, you've likely experienced the impact of rising insurance premiums year after year. With the challenging insurance marketplace, having a specialist who focuses on your industry is critical now more than ever before. If you'd like a second set of eyes on your current insurance program or don't have a relationship with your current broker, please contact Bryce Knuth at 407-697-6944 via call or text or email bryce.knuth at ioausa.com. Don't let rising insurance costs catch you off guard. Reach out to Bryce today. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, for me, you know, my right my first entry into the career was with a Fortune 500 company. And I knew, I had, luckily I had a mentor right. who was in the industry. He was a developer. He's been successful for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And he was like, look, you need to go be under a big flag. That's good Because advice. when, you're, when yeah. you're calling and, you, and it yep. was in, it's investment sales, right? So we're not oh, doing yeah. little TI leases <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, having that name behind you sure. is important, you know, whether it's a big flag or a team. Have you seen, you know, because you obviously talk to a lot of students um, at Fordham. Mm -hmm. Have you seen more success with them getting, I guess, quote unquote, that mentorship by going with a big flag or more boutique style? I've seen both. I mean, I don't I don't. I don't think the size of the firm or the name, the name brandedness of the firm is necessarily the qualifier. I mean, some of the most successful brokers I know, their name is on the name of the brokerage, right? Sure. I mean, so, um, and that's, now granted, some of the people I know, probably some of the same people, you know, if we don't want to start naming names, but, you know, if you look at their background, they were, they started at some of the biggest firms ever, and then they start their own boutique firm. Going to work for that person or that boutique firm, totally different than mm -hmm. is if you're just sort of working at one of these large franchise style brokerages that, um, you know, now look, you could be on a team with someone. So, so I almost think that I, what I actually will tell a student is it's the individual position. So like, who is the person? And I don't care if that's the person at the big, big bank brand name, publicly traded company, or the small three person firm. And candidly, if you're at the small three person firm, it's a little bit harder to disappear. So, you know, if you're, but you may get less support. So I, I think it's hyper individualistic. Um, I have seen students fail out or hate both sides of it. So I, I can't say that there's any, uh, definitive way. Although I, I do think that the large flagged firms make it harder to get in. So I do think there's a little bit, if you're, if you're able to get the said job, there's a lot more support resources for you. So, you know, that, but not everyone's going to get those jobs. Yeah. So we'll end on this last question. Um, you know, as, because you had mentioned it earlier is maybe you don't have the right skill set, mm -hmm. right. At that time. Right. Um, how does one go about gaining that skill set? Because, for me, the more I learn, and I learn stuff every day yeah. about the industry, about deals, about stuff, the more when you look at a new deal, you're like, hey, I can I can put this together, you know, very easily because of all the other experience that you've had. Yeah. So how does one go about trying to gain that knowledge? I mean, obviously searching for a mentor is huge. Sure. And then vetting that mentor is even bigger because so you got- hopefully the mentor finds you out a little bit. So yeah. I think, there, right. I think there's some duality right. in that, yeah. Because- one of the things I had a guy on here um, in season one, you know, he said a lot of the times the most successful brokers aren't very good mentors. That can be very, uh, that can be very true. I mean, sometimes, uh, look, I'll teach, go back to the academic world. Sometimes the very best teachers or professors of things aren't necessarily the, most the same people who are like the high end CEO of a company. And shocking to know if you were to go grab like s some high end CEO type threw them in a classroom, they could be god awful. Yeah. They might give a great speech. They might, right. they may, there, there are certain performance arts that are that, that sure. cross over, but the actual designing a lesson plan or actually guiding people through it could be, yeah. So that that's a very true. In fact, I would even say to some extent, and then you see this in some of the better firms where better people who are better coaches, mentors are put in more managerial roles and they're not put on, they're removed from the front line or they they grab, that's almost they don't gravitate. So um, I, I do, I think that's candidly true, but I, I, I do think from a skill standpoint, I have to, and maybe this is an interesting point to end on the night. And I, I almost feel, I almost feel like I'm betraying my own past history in saying this a little bit. But there really is something to be said about the older you get, just the bet, the easier certain things get. And there's a reason why your income kind of accelerates the older sure. you get, or, or that is a common thing to be observed if you're saying it. And it's, um, you know, I actually say this sometimes when I have very frustrated, very young students. I see who's like 22, 23 coming out of college, and they get very frustrated that they're not maybe getting the respect they think they deserve. There's a little bit of entitlement ego, but I say, listen, that's why I say, this is not a joke. I say, okay, you're under 25. 
no one's going to really respect you until you turn 25. And then I say, you're going to walk into a firm and you think you're ready to like go be running big deals. You're ready to be the hot shot. They're not even sure you're competent enough to turn on the copy machine. Yeah. Like that. Now the truth is somewhere in the middle. I say yeah, like right. the truth is you're not that bad, but you're also not that good. Then there, but there is, then I remember someone telling me, oh, well, you know, no one really will respect you until you turn 35 or something. I'm like, and so I was, I wasn't 35 yet. Yeah. I think this person thought I was over 35. <laughs> I run, and he was saying it to a person sitting next to me um, who was over 35, but she looked like she wasn't. It was kind of a funny, awkward conversation. But then as I got there and those things, like, you know, I get why that person said that. So yeah. I think that to some extent, just accept that, like, you're going to be, you know, where you, you do suck. You don't know all these things. Why should you know the same thing that has 20 years experience? Sure. But guess what? That person has 20 years experience. Guess what? They had zero experience as a search. Right. That's all equal. You're all equal. So just do it. Don't really worry about it. The one thing that if you are younger or newer, and this is why it's a little bit harder for, I think, people who maybe sometimes, sometimes older making career switches in this, and though I've seen it successfully done, I've seen it not go so well. You do have time, right? So work harder. I mean, to some extent, if you don't have the if you don't have the twenty years experience, just know what to do. Spend an extra ten hours on it, right? That's what you can control. You can control your time. You can control your energy until you can kind of you know be the person who you know what's the thing of the expert who walks in and diagnoses them the broken machine, puts an X, taps it, and then hands a fifty thousand bill and says, you know what, one tap, one dollar. We're knowing where to do it. Forty nine thousand yeah. nine hundred ninety nine, <laughs> yeah. right? You'll get to that point. But when you're day one, you're just gonna have to do a lot more hammer right. swings until you figure it out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I would I would 100% agree with that. I think that it is part of that internal fortitude, right, of you going out and, and searching. There's a ton of resources out there. Right. There's there's books. There's events. There's you know people in yep. the industry. And I would say on top of that, surrounding yourself with those 20 year experience. Guys. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know getting knowledge from them, asking them questions. Reading books even. People are, there's amazing ways. Podcasts. Pod, podcasts, yes. <laughs> but yeah, audiobooks, read books, podcasts. Well, I mean, there's a million ways to immerse yourself in it. And in fact, that's why I say immersion. Go to events. Yeah. Go to conferences. Spend Even if you have to spend your own money to fly like out to like, you know, International Council Shopping Centers. They have a big open conference in Las Vegas. I mean, there's so many places to meet people, see things. You know, whether your firm is supportive of you or not, you got to do those kind of things. Sure, sure. That's great, great advice. Um, so do you want to leave the students or young professionals with anything before we go to the next episode? Yeah, I would say don't be afraid of failure and making mistakes. I think that one of the, I have seen students ask questions with fear and trepidation that if they don't get the exact right job, they think they're going to be off a course. They have this golden pathway that they have to follow. They start as an analyst at this thing and it has to be like Blackstone or one of those firms that like everyone talks about and like majority of people will not get a job there even sure. if you go to like Harvard <laughs> it's just the reality is that they're they don't they can hire anybody they want somewhat yeah. and I always just say like that's not how it works sure you know you you don't have to follow perfect you can make a mistake if you don't get the perfect job now it doesn't mean you're precluded from getting the better job that you think it gets to so so just kind of relax and have more fun with it that's awesome yeah Great advice. Great advice. So we're going to jump to, we're going to cut this and we're going to jump to episode two. So episode two, guys, we're going to be talking about the state of the economy, how tech is transitioning into the commercial real estate and development industry and much more to come. I'm your host, Branson Bowen. Stay tuned for episode two with Josh Harris.